Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles or follow along on the screens when the passages are placed up there. James chapter 3 and verses 17 and 18. This morning, we're going to look at what wisdom is. We're going to see its motivation, and its motivation must be first. By the way, what motivates a person is so important. And then we're going to talk about the features, and then you'll see the fruit of a life of wisdom. This is an incredible text. Stand with me for the reading of the Bible, God's Word. Thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and full of good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I always like to sort of make a statement parenthetically to draw you in a little bit and possibly even whet your appetite. See if I can do it. The Bible says that the fruit of righteousness is sown. I thought seeds were sown. You'll find nowhere else in your Bible where fruit is sown. But that's an interesting truth. It goes a little deeper than we normally go in understanding what God does with our life. Heavenly Father, speak into our lives and help us to realize what real wisdom is, that we would not only seek it, but see it and apply it. For Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. Wisdom from above. The book of James has a way of causing me to love the Proverbs more dearly. Proverbs 2 and verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom for his his mouth, from his mouth, comes knowledge and understanding. Listen to what it says. He stores up sound wisdom for those who want to do right. What's up right? He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of, of justice, and he preserves the way of his saints. Now, James makes it clear that wisdom from above cannot be known apart from a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, who is himself the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Now, James serves not only as a practical theologian, but also he's the master of contrasting principles. The book of James is loaded with the conjunction, but followed oftentimes with then. In these two verses, James gives the most comprehensive commentary on wisdom. So what I want to do is make three statements. I've really attempted to choose my words carefully because this is such a dear subject to me. I want you to listen to these three statements. The first statement is, he mentions the first in wisdom. He says, but the wisdom that is from above. So remember, it's not an attainment of man, but it's a gift from God. It's something that comes down to us, not acquired, but applied. So the wisdom is contrasted with what we read in verse 15 where he says there's a wisdom that does not descend from above. But here's the statement, the first in wisdom. He says, wisdom is first pure. Now, by the way he used it in the structure of the language and sentence where he said it's first pure, then we don't tie pureness with the other seven characteristics follow. We believe that he put first there as an emphasis of priority, which demonstrates motivation. And so it leads us to see the motive for godly wisdom rather than the characteristic that it will serve. So the motivation for this wisdom from above is motivated by purity. Its primary quality is purity. It is pure in the sense of being undefiled, morally pure. There's two words that I believe really define pureness as it pertains to wisdom. Let me give you those two statements. The first is spiritual integrity. That the integrity, the truthfulness, is not just truthfulness, but it's absolute truthfulness. It's spiritual truthfulness. And then the second statement is moral sincerity. I'm not just sincere, but I'm morally sincere, James is saying. So this purity comes when one has been cleansed by Christ's blood, who is himself pure. 
He uses the same word here that he uses in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3 where the Bible says that the very fact that we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, it ought to lead us to purity. Did you know throughout the New Testament, the imminent return of Jesus serves as a motivating factor for living a life of purity and holiness. Just the very fact that he could come now, I don't want to be somewhere that I would want him finding me that's not honorable and pure to him. And so this purity has been received from Christ's purity and as a result is leading an individual to a morally pure life. Now, let me go a little further. This person's heart that James is describing is pure in its unmixed devotion to God. We have to constantly as believers be honest and say, are there any rivals? Is there any rivals in my heart to Christ? It carries the idea of being pure in one's focus on God, concentrating on serving Him. It involves moral purity before God and devotional purity in one's focus on Him. Uh, Kent Hughes put it this way. Listen, this is a great definition. Wisdom being pure is the key to all the qualities of wisdom to follow. It is the overarching attribute. The authenticity and intensity of one's purity determines the outworking of the other qualities of wisdom. Now, let me go a step further with that. Here's what he's saying. If you're not rightly motivated in your relationship with God and your devotion to God in that you realize that you need to be pure in motive and in moral, the other characteristics are not automatic. What he's saying is, listen to this statement, pureness is a deal breaker for the other seven qualities to follow. In other words, it's, it's a conditional statement to receive what follow. So it shows the importance. So remember, it is first. It is in priority. It is uh, that which cannot be left out, and it must be in that particular order. And so this principle teaches that all who possess purity are to make perfect purity in one's moral and devotional life a primary goal. So the Christian who wants to live in wisdom can ask no better question regarding his thoughts, his words, his actions, and his devotion than, am I pure? This is a personal reflection. This is not, I wish so-and-so were here to hear this sermon. It's draw a circle around you and ask God to speak to only the person in the circle. Am I pure. First in priority. It means clean. It means innocent. It means holy. It's where we derive our word sanctification. Sanctification is the word that means to be set aside for God's holy purposes. Sanctification, listen carefully, is so important because it's the evidence of salvation. If there is no sanctification, there's a question mark on whether a person's really saved. And so he uses the word there, this pure. So here's what he's saying. Pureness needs to be first because what follows is evidence that you got the priority in its proper place. Now, let me tell you what I found. This is really incredible. When I was preaching on former verses and we talked a little bit about the armor of God. Now, I know you all remember this if you were here. I talked about the armor of God, and I showed you also there's the armor of righteousness and the armor of light. I came to the conclusion that each of those uh, work against three different enemies uh, of the Christian life. Uh, the armor of God is there to protect us against the devil. The armor of light is to keep us in the light so we don't find ourselves doing things that people of darkness do, and it pertains to the area of the flesh, keeping us pure. And then the armor of righteousness uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, I think is there to protect us from the world and its system that would come against the truth. But let me tell you what I found out as I talked, thought about wisdom. And I could have taken it for every verse, but I'll just do it with a few. I found that as the Bible 
unloads wisdom and helping us to better understand it and giving us its futures, features, it actually magnifies the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are Jesus' teaching, and they're really very pointed and very powerful. I mean, it's one-liners. Like, for instance, here's one for this text. Uh, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. He uses a present tense verb. He's not talking about if you're pure, you go to heaven. He's talking about you're pure and you see the activity of God now. Uh, you, you see him. You sense him. You see his activity. You can get in on what God's up to. How under heaven can you get, on, get in on what God's up to if you can't see what God's up to? And so he says when you're pure, you have wisdom to know where God's moving and you can join him. Now, let's talk about the features of wisdom. Verse 17, he says, wisdom is peaceable. But listen to this. I want to make sure you understand this. Because sometimes you can say, if this person doesn't agree with me and I feel I'm right, they must not have God's wisdom. Now, I want you to hold that thought for just a moment. What does it mean that wisdom is peaceable? Now, you need, to, you need this. If you're a leader, you need what I'm about to share with you. First of all, it means peace-loving. And by the way, I love peace. But I, to say I want peace at all costs... You need to know what it's already cost my dear Lord that gave me these words before you try to put me in a corner. It speaks of external features that flow from its pure character. It means you are a promoter of peace. Now, peace comes most of all in a right relationship between man and God, but then also it demonstrates itself in peace between man and man. By the way, the word peaceable comes from a root at one. God wants to get us at one. And by the way, I just need to say something. In my 24th year here at church, <clears throat> don't make me dishonest in this statement. Y'all are the most peace-loving people in the world. This church has been relatively a piece of cake to lead because y'all have just been so peace-loving. I mean, you've, you've embraced uh, God's heart. In, in desiring to go to the nations to plant churches, uh, whatever we've just felt that God was leading us to do in the Bible, you have been so good. Listen what the Bible says. Again, the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are who? The peacemakers. For why? They shall be called the sons of God. Occasionally, when somebody helps you to resolve conflict, you know what you say? Oh, you're an angel. No, they're not an angel. They're beyond the angels. They're sons of God. They're daughters of God. God. Thank God for the family of God made up of daughters and sons of God that bring peace in the midst of conflict in the family of God. So this person does not perpetrate conflict by selfishness but produces peace by their humility. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Now here's the statement God really used to speak into my life. Listen to this. James is not recommending a peace that depends on walking away from conflict. Rather, he is commending a peaceful spirit resting in your work and battle. At times, this is a good statement, at times you make waves because of a biblical principle that's at stake, but ordinarily you refrain from turbulence and rejoice in making peace. But it, mean, it doesn't mean that you come to the place that you can't, you can't forge forward because you believe what you're doing is right, but you do it the whole time with a peaceful heart. And you're not troubled. It doesn't steal your sleep at night. You're not angry. It's not a, I've got to have my way. And if you think that's what it is, keep listening. He's going to unload this thing for us in a wonderful way. Ephesians 4, 3 puts it this way, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul put it this way at Rome, Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may build up another. Uh, Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. I love that verse. So he moves from that and he says, now here's what wisdom looks like. This is what he's talking about, is the features. First of all, it's pure. Make sure you're right with God. That means you've got to get an open Bible, get your devotional helps, set before the Lord, kneel before the Lord, lay before the Lord, and make sure you're right. So what you do, you get before him, and you ask this question, and then get quiet. Am I pure? And then he begins to unload it. You begin to deal with, are you peaceable? Are you at rest in me? 
Are you gentle? That's, this is a big word. <laughs> it means considerate. It's the word, I wrote a sermon for a conference I preached on recently. I dealt with the doctrine of forbearance. Have you ever studied the doctrine of forbearance? Let me give you about the doctrine of forbearance from God's perspective. The Bible says that God, who is forbearing, that means that God overlooked your fault in order to meet your need. You may say, well, how do you mean God overlooked my fault? God could have judged you and deemed you lost as you were and, and placed a sentence on you, not just placing it there, but carrying the sentence out the first time you ever volitionally sinned. Or he could have just done it because you already had it in your nature. But the, really, the Bible, it uses this word, he passed over. He, he waited on our needs. Listen, Christ made a sacrifice for my sins, but even though he'd made the sacrifice for my sins, I was cursing him, swearing against him, lying, cheating, stealing, and yet he in his four Parents waited until I repented instead of passing judgment on me. That's, that's the word he uses here. Matthew Henry said that he wraps this word up in sweet reasonableness. It's referred to as the most untranslatable word in the list, according to Greek scholars. It means not to be harsh or critical, but one that can submit to dishonor and abuse and mistreatment and persecution. Now, wait a minute. I want to make sure you understand that. He's, he's referring to a person that's full of wisdom that can actually submit to unreasonableness and persecution. When the Bible says Jesus was gentle, it don't mean he was a wimp. It means, it, it means he would go to the cross and he would suffer unjustly in order to make a way for us. So it's not a wimp. Leaders normally have some tenacity about them. You have some convictions. How about the beatitude that puts this in perspective? Listen to the beatitude. Matthew 5, 10, Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. What does he say? There's just the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean? They're going to heaven? No, he says God's rules in their life. God's ruling them. You know, they're wise because heaven's on the throne of their heart. Blessed are you when you revile and persecute. Uh, when you are reviled and they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's what it does. It describes the kind of person who though wronged and possessing the right not to bend nevertheless foregoes his or her rights. So the man or woman with this quality makes allowances for the weaknesses and ignorance of others and, and, and takes the kindest perspective whenever possible. Here's what it means. Is you make allowances for even ugly things that can be said about you in the context. Now, listen, I'm saying that they're not true. And you make it, now, if they're true, you need some help. <laughs> All right. But he's, he's referring to somebody like Jesus. And someone that wants to be like Jesus and things are being said, and you make allowances for them, and you find yourself caring deeply for the ones who wound you. Wow. Boy, that's like, by the way, let me say something to you. That's not easy to do. But that's what he'd have us to do. And, and the more the church looks like Jesus, the more the world's going to be captivated by it. Then he says, listen to this, he says they're willing to yield. That means easily to entreat. It really means you're submissive. You're willing to submit to persuasion. You're open to reason. You're teachable. Have you ever heard somebody say this? Well, go ahead and tell me what, what, what you're thinking and what you're trying to do, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to convince me differently. That means they're not willing to yield. They're not a very wise person. Facts are our friends. It means they'll be reasonable. But sometimes someone may say, listen to this, I don't care what you say, I won't be convinced differently. I'm going to make a statement that's a very unwise person. What you've said is, it's not possible for me to learn more in that area. It is, it's commending an open, teachable spirit. It means you're willing to learn. It means you're ready to cooperate. It, it carries the context of uh, conciliatory. It means ready to be convinced. It's compliant and not stubborn. It's what a man does with his wife regularly. But anyway, not stubborn. You, you, you're compliant. All right, number, number four, the word is full of mercy. There it is again, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The believer who is full of mercy evidences saving faith and transformed life. Now, I need you to listen carefully because I want to balance out teaching. 
Uh, my gift is exhortation. My wife's gift is profit. Therefore, we may not have much mercy. You cannot use that to write off not having mercy because you have a different spiritual gift. God wants you to be like Jesus regardless of what spiritual gift you have. So he says you'd be full of mercy. Let me tell you what it means to be full of mercy. It means to be controlled by mercy. All right, what is mercy? Mercy is giving someone something they don't deserve. What's the very reason we don't help people sometimes and show mercy? They're in a mess. They did what's wrong. They deserve justice. And you don't? So he's saying that's the thing about it. This is diametrically opposed to the world system. Instead of giving them the justice they deserve, show them mercy what they don't deserve just like Jesus did you. So wisdom, so really it, it evidences saving faith in a transformed life, not only by forgiving those who have wronged you, but reaching out to them. It's really the story. It's, if you want to see a story that defines this word, it's the Good Samaritan. It's being concerned and compassionate for anyone who is suffering or who has any kind of need. Here's what it means, compassion and action. It, it means that you see something and it doesn't just break your heart, it moves you to action. The question is, is your heart linked to action? That's the word for mercy. Jesus didn't just look down and say, I pity those sinners on their way to hell. He disrobed himself, clothed himself in flesh, born of a virgin, came into this world, the sinless son of God, and went to the cross and did something about it. That's the mercy that is wise that he's talking about here. So listen, don't you dare watch a program that breaks your heart because of poverty. Write a check! <laughs> no, don't just be concerned about the nations. <laughs> Go to the nations, give to the nations, pray for the nations. It's compassionate, rich in mercy. Listen, here's the great, my great verse, Ephesians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he, he did what? He loved us. Uh, have mercy in abundant measure is what he's saying. It, it leads to practical helps. It's mercifulness toward people who are in trouble, who don't deserve it. A spirit of concern that seeks to provide for the needy. Here's what I wrote in my notes. When I, I was writing, every now and then something just inspires me and I just wrote it down. Here's what I wrote. Find that person in your church and become their friend. That's a great friend to have as a person that's full of mercy. Because if you're a leader... Who you will need them. Full of good fruit, quickly. Good deeds. Remember, it's not what you say, it's what you show that demonstrates wisdom. It's good actions, not just... Oh, this is a good, this is a good way to say it. It's not just leaves, it's fruit. I'm going to tell you what I, I believe is one of the great needs of the, the American church. Everybody professes to be a Christian... And all you see in many of their lives are leaves. But the Bible says if it's real, it's fruit. If you plant an apple tree, you don't, the season before it bears, tell everybody, you ought to see the leaves on my apple tree. Whoopee duck. You are not concerned about the leaves. You're saying stuff like this. Next year at this time, we will be eating apples because you expect it to bear fruit, not just empty boasting. The word that's used, see it's plural, <coughs> it suggests variety of fruits, good deeds of many kinds. As fruits are expected and desired of a good tree, so are deeds expected <coughs> of wisdom. John 15, look, look it up, I'm pushing on time. Ephesians 5, 9, check it out. So here's what he's saying. You demonstrate your genuine faith by your authentic good works. <clears throat> it is exemplifying the fruit of the Spirit. But then he says you also do it without partiality. It means to distinguish, it's without variance, it's free from vacillation, it's Undivided is <clears throat> wholehearted loyalty in contrast to inconsistent, which you see about the mouth in James 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, can the same mouth bless and curse inconsistencies? It means you shouldn't be impartial. Um, 
or, or you should be impartial, unwavering conviction, unloyalty, uh, and undivided loyalty. It means no favoritism. You, do, you just, you love people. It operates on a consistent principle. Let me wrap it up by talking to you. And remember, we talked about the first in wisdom. You've got to get it right. This, you, can't, you can't miss first base. Am I pure? Number two, the features, seven words. The, these are the features. This is what wisdom looks like. That's wisdom from, a, from heaven. And if I had time, I could go back and contrast it to the wisdom from below. And that'd be another whole part of this message. But then he says, but here's the fruit. And remember, I hope I've already drawn you in. It says, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who sow peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. You may say the seed is sown, not fruit. But it is possible that James had in mind the idea of fruit being harvested and then in part becoming seed, which is re-sown in peace, as it were, and produce still more fruit and so on. The seed represents godly wisdom whose fruit is righteousness. Godly wisdom produces a continuing cycle of righteousness which is planted and harvested in peaceful, harmonious relationships between God and his faithful people and between these people themselves. God's wisdom is not only displayed for others, but it's delivered to others. Now, here's my favorite part of what I want to say. We are not to sow the seeds of righteousness, but the fruit of righteousness. Why is that, Pastor? God sows seeds of righteousness in lives. Have you ever thought about this? I don't have the capacity to put the seed of righteousness in your heart. Righteousness is what you didn't have, remember? For he who knew no sin became sin for us, that the righteousness of God might be imputed to us. So here's how I became a Christian. A preacher didn't save me. The Baptist church didn't save me. A religion didn't save me. But God saved me. I'm born of the seed. What am I born of? The seed of God. The Bible says that the seed of God is in you. You will not habitually live a life of sin. And if you practice sin, that's your normal demeanor of your life. Uh, you've never had the seed of God. So here's what God did. God planted a seed in me. And you know what it did? Listen to me. It bore fruit. And now I sow the fruit of righteousness.